the organizers of this program, uh, when they came to me, uh, told me it is singles and relationship fellowship. And from what they say, I could deduce that this is run every year. I might be wrong, but this is for 2015. Uh, so they asked me to come and speak to you. Singles and relationships. So people who are single, people who are into relationships, but they want to do it the Christian way. Let us say the Catholic way. So some of you are new, I'm told. Here are some, amongst us, are some people who are married, some who are into relationships already, but are not yet married, trying to see the hand of God. And others who are still single, uh, because maybe their time has not come, or they are, they are also patient waiting for God. So these three categories of people are here this afternoon, all because we are here on the mountain of the Lord. Upon Mount Zion shall there be deliverance. And the people of Israel, the house of Israel shall possess their, possess their, tell someone next to you, you will possess your possessions. You will possess your possessions. My dear friends, my dear sisters, my dear brothers, I want to inform you that Mount Zion wasn't any ordinary mountain. It was called Mount Zion because the people of Israel believed that Zion itself was the city of God. So everything in Zion was blessed. So the only mountain that can be found in Zion was Mount Zion. They named it Mount Zion because that was the mountain of the Lord. And look at where we are at a grotto. If we understand the word grotto, a grotto because of a mountain. A grotto is a place, a mountainous place to go to pray, to meet Jesus, to meet God. And you have come here to our Mount Zion. Look at that. Can you see the mountain? You have come up here on Mount Zion this afternoon. And as he has said, you receive your deliverance. Amen. Amen. And upon this same Mount Zion, you possess your possessions. Amen. Amen. Those of us who are here because you possess marriage. Only possess happiness in marriage, only possess our partners. This is our Mount Zion. And as you come here, you will never leave here the same. Amen. Amen. I'm not saying that. God is telling you, you have come upon Mount Zion. This is our grotto. This is our Mount Zion. And when here we are here to experience God. So the topic for today, as you know, the theme actually is, but it was not so from the beginning. But it was not so from the beginning. When I ask the organizers again what they want me to talk about, they say, Father, this is a general theme. But you know, this year, Father, families and relationships have gone through so much, especially with the issue of uh, homosexuality. This year it has taken so much attention, locally and internationally. So, Father, I want you to base your topic on that particular aspect. Talk about anything, but that is what we want to tell our people. We want the young people to know that what the Kali Church says about this issue. What is the stand of the Kali Church? If somebody is a homosexual, is a Catholic, what must she do? What must he do? Father, tell us the truth according to the Bible. What does the Bible say? So, what should we do in the face of all these challenges? Father, what should we do when people are telling that this is good, it's even lawful? You can go to court and marry. What is God saying? What is the Catholic Church saying? So I'm going to talk on this thing, but it was not so from the beginning. With the line of this issue that is happening around, and then we shall let God speak to us before we leave here. So that is the purpose for our garden. And to speak for some, some 40 minutes. So I want us to look at the basis of our theme. Please, those with Bibles, uh, if there's any extra mic, microphone, please. Someone should open to Matthew chapter 19. We shall take 3 to 8. Uh, and then please give the microphone someone to read for us to listen. After which, I'll begin my expose of that. Matthew chapter 19, verses 3 to 8. Uh, please, someone should get it to read for us. As our Lord allowed a man to divorce his wife for whatever reason he wishes, Jesus answered, Haven't you read the scripture that says that in the beginning the Creator made people male and female? And God said, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and unite with his wife, 
and the two will become one. So they are no longer two, but one. No human being must separate, then what God has joined together. The Pharisees asked him, Why then did Moses give the law for a man to hand his wife a divorce notice and send her away? Jesus answered, Moses gave you permission to divorce your wives because you are so hard to teach. But it was not like that at the time of creation. Amen. Moses knew your stubborn heart, so he allowed you to divorce your wives, but it was not so in the beginning. Amen. That is my translation. So what was it in the beginning? But it was not so in the beginning. You know, my dear friends, when the Pharisees heard the word beginning, their mind was straight away saying back to God. Because amongst them, the word beginning is for God. All beings, all human beings, all things on this earth has or have beginnings. It was only one person that we can say who has no beginning, and that is who? That is God. So when I mention the word beginning, then we are talking about who, who has no beginning. So when Jesus said, but it was not so from the beginning, the people readily, straight away, knew that he was talking about God in the beginning. Because when you go to Genesis, now let us go to Genesis. Of course, as you know, the word Genesis means what? Beginning. The Hebrew word is Bereshit. And Bereshit means beginning. So, when you go to Genesis, as Jesus quoted, he quoted from Genesis. The story is very interesting, but very familiar. That in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You know, look at the way the Bible speaks about the beginning. Which means that nothing was there but God alone. God alone existed and was in charge of everything. But there was nothing. So he said, okay, I want to make something out of nothing. <laughs> Just imagine that. Nothing of this sort we are seeing was there. Or God imagine getting something out of nothing. You know, we create things out of something. If you want to do, uh, read a Bible, you have to get a Bible. If you want to do something, you have to but God started from nothing, then he got something. So he told them, let us create. Then he said, let there be light. And there was light. God created light in the first place because, so to say, to let it, so let it, darkness was everywhere. But God said, no, let me put light so that we can see. When there is light, you can see everything. And when there is light, you can see the person next to you in the night. I wonder if there's darkness, you can't even see your way, you might even stumble and what and fall. So you all need light to see the truth. So for God to create light in the first place means that He wants us to know the truth. The light stands for truth. Because darkness overshadows us, darkness deceives us. In dark, what you look black, when you put on the light, it becomes what? Green or blue or white. So in darkness, we don't see well. And darkness here stands for sin. For we Christians, for we human beings. So no, sin is not necessary. We don't need sin. So send darkness away. Let there be light. Let the truth prevail. And then there was light. If you read the account of creation in Genesis chapter 1 following, then the sun comes in, then the moon comes in, then the plants come in, then the animals come in. It's like a liturgical procession. Have you seen Father and the man service and the ministers coming for mass on Sundays before? See where they are, they make the lines. The man service is ahead, the readers follow. Then you see the procession. Just read Genesis with this understanding. I think God is saying, the sun, the sun, let the sun, let the sun will come and march in front of God away. Moon, moon will come and march in front of God away. Plants, plants come and march in front of God away. Animals, so see, presenting an liturgical procession of creation. And why are all these animals, why is all why all these species in possession? Because we are supposed to worship God. When we come to Mass and we are in possession, you see the priests and the medicine going, we are here to worship God. Because we are possessing to Him. And so when God made all these things come one after the other, He didn't let everything come up straight away. One after the other, one by the other. 
one by one. Everything took its place. Then what happens? Then the last thing he created was who? Human being. Again, if you come to Mars and you see where is Father's place in the procession? Is there one person to come? Hello? Is the priest the first person to come in the procession? No. In procession, the one who comes last is the because he's the most important of those in their possession. And God places human beings the last of the possession. Just look at it that way. The human being, let us create man in his own in, in our own image and likeness. Man comes last. Tell us that look, all these things that have come before in the possession are all subject to man. So man comes last. Then he comes on the scene. Again, man also watches matches into the possession. And so God this man, look, man, all these have come before you. You have power and dominion over them. Give them names. Oh, let that this one be a lion. Give them names. Let this one be called a king. Give them names. Let this one be called fish. Give them names. The man keeps giving you new names to animals and everything. Because God has placed man, human beings, in charge of everything in our lives. Praise the Lord. God is good. And all the time. So man now comes as the summit of God's creation. It's perfection. The perfect creature. He comes to a stage and takes control. And it's like God is watching. Then God says, gives names, he gives the names. They say, whatever man calls him, I call him so. Then we are told that God said that, okay, everything is good. I'm happy. Then when you look again at the man, he wasn't happy. Why? Because he said that, the man wasn't happy. He needs a helper. So we are told that God says, All right, I see you are lonely. You are alone. I'll give you a helpmate, a companion, a partner. And then we are told, as we heard last Sunday at Mass, that the man slept. And what happened? God took out of his ribs and created what? And he, another human being. But this one, a perfect one. But the man sees her and says, Oh, at last, finally. Flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. He can see somebody who looks like him, who he can identify with. So, my dear friends, in the beginning, God intended for relationships. It is clear from even Genesis. For him to say, Let us create, as you know now, let us, who and who? He asks English plural, right? So, God is a relationship. He's not being alone, so we call it three persons in one God, Trinity. God is a relationship. God is a family. There's a father, there's a son, there's Holy Spirit, there's love. So God is a family. He's a relationship. So human beings must not live their life as if they are islands. No. We are all interrelated. And as church members, we call the family of God. Those who are biologically related, you know it. In this world, relationship is needed. We all feel to be in relationships and to be related. Because in the beginning, that was the plan of God. He said that let the man must not be alone. He gave him a helper. A relationship. That beautiful relationship in Genesis, in Eden, the God Eden, was so good to look at. We were the perfect time of humanity. You call it paradise. Everything was there. Everything was happiness. Yet, if you continue reading the book of Genesis, my dear brothers, my dear sisters, you will come to realize that that wasn't all because man, woman, now thought that, oh, you want to have more freedom. I mean, there is a three now. Then we are told that the, the, the serpent, the snake you call him, the devil actually, came to them and said, uh, okay, is it true that he, God, says, you should not eat that, that fruit, that tree. Say, yes, it is true. Did he really say that if you eat it, you will die? Uh, yes, he did say that. Yes, let me do a little bit of explanation if I continue. Now, when God told Adam and Eve, we call them, that they should not eat of the fruit, the tree, uh, the fruit, otherwise they will die, the Hebrew word is, is interesting. English cannot give us that, so the English would uh, you die. But if you look at the Hebrew meaning of if you eat it, you will die. If I want to bring it to English, it should sound like this. 
if you eat it, you will die and die. You will die and die. Or you will die at death. I don't know. It, it doesn't sound... It, it's not meaningful to you. So it is whatever it is there. If I buy there, you will die at death. Or you will die and die. What is the name of that? It sounds nothing to us. So English doesn't have it. So English put just there, you will die. So God has told that if the day you eat it, you will die and die. You will die at death. Then the devil came and said, ah, the God said that when you eat, you will just die. Hello? Hello? You see, God was saying they will die and death. Die and die. This, the devil came and said, did he say you will die? Say yes. You see how the devil had tricked them? When God was talking about dying, dying, he was talking about death, dying. You see, yes, you see what he said. When he has tricked them. So that is so true. Eat it. He doesn't want you to be like him. <laughs> you, he doesn't want you to be like him. That's why he's saying that. He's a selfish God. You see, you are, you are, the body is for you. You are yourself. You can do whatever you like. And this is somebody says, I'm born a woman, but I feel I'm a man. Have you heard that thing before? Or I'm a man, but I feel I'm a woman. So I'm going to change my nature, give myself breast, you know, so I can look like a woman, a man. <laughs> it's funny. Even science will never agree to this. You know, the science tells us that uh, the, 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 our chromosomes, you know, 23, 23, 46, and then the man's own is X, Y, and the woman's own is what? S, X, good. So if biologically you are X, S, and you say you want to do it, no one can go and change that, that, that thing. It's not possible. Physically you may change, but within what you create, what you make is, can't be changed. And then they are happy that now they have rest. Yeah, I say you are laughing. And he says, this makes me happy. This makes me happy. You know, a, a woman who says, now I'm a man. And she says, this makes me happy. You know, human beings is the one thing that will make us happy. Satisfied. It makes me feel good that I dress this way and I can expose and pack my body. I feel good. See? So, with human beings, I think about myself, how I feel. Me, 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 me. How I feel. Interesting. If I were to take you back to the story of the fall, the eating of the fruits, whatever it is, has a meaning. Why were they? Why did they eat? Because the devil is telling you, you are not satisfied. So eat. Why do you eat? We eat when you are not satisfied. You are hungry, right? So the devil says, you eat. Satisfy your hunger. So eating the fruit means that they were eating to satisfy them. So they thought they were not satisfied. And this is, we are eating everything. Look at that. Just know them. Fellow sinners. Look at the things we eat spiritually. We eat them. Relationships are now eating certain things that are not allowed in relationships. At the workplace, we are eating certain things that are not allowed in, in the, at the workplace. At the church, society members, even within ourselves, we are eating things among us that are not there. All because we want to satisfy ourselves. The same story as it was in the beginning. I don't believe. They were not satisfied. So they had to eat to satisfy themselves. That was the only thing. So whenever you and I we do like satisfy ourselves, getting something for our own personal things, then there is a problem. That is the beginning of the problem. It's a mistake on our part. I don't believe knew that. And it's okay. We don't feel satisfied. This food will make it satisfied. So we shall eat it. So my dear friends, I'm asking you to watch what you eat spiritually. Sin is a food that you don't have to eat. But we eat them. The kinds of sins, you know them. I don't, I'm not here to give a theology of sins, which I know you know well. We are thorough sinners, so we know them very, very well. So after eating and then getting satisfied now, then they realize that they are, they are now rather naked. They wanted to suffer themselves, but they are rather naked. When you feel naked, what is it? There is something that is what? Out of you. If you are naked, it means sometimes you take it out. Of course, your clothing or something. When they did that, they realized that they were naked because the gold that they were wearing had been taken off. Eh? When they are taking off gold from their lives, so the Bible says that they are naked. That is the meaning of that. Because God had clothed them. It was gold that they had put on. Their conscience was guarded by God. The way they look at things was guided by God. The way they walk was guided by God. But when they ate it, then all the God 
was covering them from head to toe vanished, so they thought naked. And it's true. When you sin, when you fornicate, when you commit adultery, I mentioned sexual sin because that's what happened in relationship in the way. How do you feel? Naked. God has gone out of you, so to say. God has deserted you. It is not true. You have rather run away from God. So they thought naked. And they wanted to clothe themselves. And they put on something that they couldn't give they couldn't give cover themselves. Nakedness before God is called by sin. You don't want to feel naked in life. Stay away from sin. Amen. You don't want to get naked in life. Stay away from sin. Amen. They thought naked and then they needed something. You know? They had they said that's the old and they could not pay. They needed someone to wash their sins away. Of course, you know the song. And God will send somebody who didn't own but had to pay the price. My dear friends, as I continue the book of Genesis, you will realize that from the beginning and now the fall, things were getting out of hand. The human beings, Adam and Eve, who had become naked, God clothed them somehow, and then he asked them to go away from the garden. We don't want them to make themselves so more horrible, to turn things around. And these things, with homosexuality, lesbianism, with transgender issues, how what we are seeing. People want to do things that will sink them. The way they feel, I feel for a man, I'm a man, but I feel for a woman, a man, so I want it. I'm a woman, but I feel for a woman. That is me, my feeling. Freedom, they call it. Right. Sometimes we cover the human rights. Human rights, no, human rights is like, uh, it's funny when you divide it. It's like, whatever you want to do is human rights. <laughs> that is wrong. Eh? Human rights is defined in the context of a larger society. And not just you. I feel like uh, walking naked. So you work in the human rights. That is funny. You see, and they use human rights so that if somebody is against me, so you are against my human rights. You see, you are against me becoming free. And they use all those things. We, we are making ourselves what we are, become God. That's not what I'm going to get to anyway. So what happens is that the Adam and Eve and the rest sin against God. Then the next chapter we see three, Cain and Abel. You know the story. Now man has injured his relationship with God. He has severed it. He has cut it off. The next thing we see is that man is now cutting off relationship with God. Another what? Human being. Cain and Abel. Cain and his brother. When we sin, we cut off our relationship with God and of course we put our human beings. So you see how the Bible has laid before us the theology of sin, which culture teaches so well that sin is against God and our neighbor. Adam and Eve against God, now tell the devil against neighbor. You see it there, right there in the Bible, naked. Just read it, just there. What happened? They came, killed his brother, then he was trying to run away. Then the thing got out of, out of control. Sin was just coming everywhere. People are doing things. Let's read the whole chapter. So, so much that in chapter 7 of Genesis, God said, no, now, enough is enough. Enough is enough. The flood. He sent the flood to destroy us. Then. It's enough. It's too dirty. I can't do that. Let me just watch the whole thing again. God has taken time and patience to create us. Then he has realized you are so dirty that he can't do anything done to just wash it. Let, let, let me just tear this part of the of the book because I don't come and see my zero by tens. You know, sometimes you, you to go in school when you get zero by ten or something. You tear that part off. You see, that like people don't see it. That's what we did to God. Our result before God was so shameful that He had to wipe us out in the flood. Human being and God. So after the flood, no one comes and see. Thinking that things will change, human beings still say, No, 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 no. God, you, we want you. We want to bring you down. We want to replace you. Now in chapter 11 of Genesis, they started building the tower of Babel. You know that story? Why were they going out there? They are going out there to take God, to remove him. It's interesting. That's what they said. They want to go there and replace him. That God, enough. You have been God for how many years? You come down. You want to be God also. So they are building their tower to go to heaven. So God there is God and remove him there and become God. Human beings trying to replace God. What do we see if a court 
Say that, okay, it's good now for a man and man to marry. For a woman to a man want to marry. So it's a law. Allow them to marry. They marry this. You know this pushing God from the throne of judgment. You know this pushing God from the throne of definition. He said we are now God. We are the judges of the world. Now we tell him again what is marriage. Again, the power of the law is, is being built in this modern world. But we don't see that's what happened. People are building the top of it, but so, so high that they want to take what's from there. If God gives a chance, they will take him. Some may have said that Christianity is not like a 4 by 100 meter really. Uh-huh. So Christianity is not like that. It's not like a 4, hand, four by 100 meter really, where after every 100 meters, somebody takes over. No. That God, okay, you have 100 meters, now give me the baton. I'm too so to continue. No. In Christianity, it is God and God alone. God doesn't race anybody in any, any race. It's like a hundred meter race. The same person starts, the same person ends. God starts, God finishes. And that's what we are seeing today. People are building towers, towers, new battles, towers of battles, trying to take away God. And that's what we saw in this year in June, when somewhere in the United States, human beings say we have redefined marriage. It's no longer man and woman alone, but now it should be man and man, woman and woman. So the age is signed and becomes a law. You are jubilated. Oh, now God has come now, you are overtaking. You are happy. Because now we are in charge, not God. We tell God what to do. If you look at it from that way, my dear friends, you know that we are in difficult times. We are in difficult times. If man is trying to push God for his throne, if man is trying to define life for himself, we call it the culture. When the culture that they want to do what they want, they are in difficult times. It is not correct. Do you know what happened? Those who go to the battle, did they succeed? Did they succeed? They didn't. God, the, the Bible says that God came down to sound them. It's not what they are doing. They find that God has to come down to sound them. And uh-huh. if that's what they are doing, then he said, okay, I know what to do. They just said, and their speech, they couldn't understand it, so they got confused on what the whole thing had to work. stop. Unfinished projects, everything had to come down. All these things we are seeing will become unfinished projects. Amen. Amen. God will place a soft work upon them. Amen. Amen. Very soon. But God needs you and I, He needs us, to go and put those soft works in life, in this world. That's why we are here. We need to know the truth and to speak it, to defend it. We need to know, no, this building is wrong. Somewhere, I didn't put the by out. Amen. Okay. <laughs> you know? They got to say, stop work. Produce what? Permits. Stop work. Today you are here. God has given you that permission to go and when you see anything that is evil, put it there. Stop work. By God. Not daily. By God. And again, to ourselves. Whatever you are doing in life, it is sinful. You have to put in there, stop work. What sin is that? Stop work. You have to put it there. Because it can't continue. If this book is allowed to, 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 to continue, it will just end up collapsing in innocent people. And these some have done that. People have sinned and their sin have captured some other people. People have been faced at this by their way of life. You know what they are doing there? And they are doing here. We are doing here. So it can happen. So the whole Tower of Babel issue is about human beings trying to replace God, which can never happen. We don't define marriage. We can't redefine marriage. Because in the first place, we didn't have the power to define it. The only person who can redefine marriage is the one who defined it in the first place. God defined it. He's the only person who can redefine it. And God has never, and is not ready to redefine that, to see us. That is why we shall come to our topic for today. But it was not so from the beginning. But it was not so from the beginning. Jesus told them that, you see why you people were divorced? Because Moses saw you as what? Stop going. You were difficult. So he, he allowed you. But I wish, I thought Jesus said, okay, Moses said that you were difficult and you stopped going, he allowed you, so you, you can continue. But he said, but don't do it. Continue. I've come to stop that. So Jesus comes down and again he brings that stop work. But I've come to stop it. But it only so in the beginning. Let's go back to the beginning. Let's go back to the beginning. How God started everything. 
So, my dear friend, that is it. These days, people want us to change the laws of the church. Like in Moses' days. They say, oh, Father, oh, Kali Church, you police see how we are suffering. Moses allowed them to change the laws, change them for us. We have, and we have succeeded in changing what the court say. Now, Kali Church allowed gays to marry. Now, Kali Church allowed man and man to marry. Change your laws. You are at work the Kali Church, two thousand years. You are still thinking like people are what? Be more than Kali Church, be more than. Change your laws. Change your definitions. Don't tell us that gay is sinful. Don't use that word. When you hear sinful, we don't like it. When you hear words, that would be nice for us. Call it, don't call them the unions. We want to call them marriages. But the Kali Church is not Kali Church. It is God's church. It's not human beings' church. We can't change it because God has done it. We can't, we can't, we are not God. And it's not because we, we are being hard on somebody. That is what God is saying. The word of God is saying. Are you here? Praise the Lord. Praise the name Jesus. So people are saying that we should change our laws. See, they are taking us back to Moses' days. We are being stubborn. These are human beings, we are being stubborn. It's very difficult. Instead of being changing to see God, you say, God, change and be like us. Become like us, rather. You don't, don't want to change. But it is so, so clear in the scriptures that Jesus, whenever he met somebody, he, he, is as, he meets the person as he is, as she is. But then he brings the person closer and changes him. He doesn't bring the person and say, be like that. As I said, he could have said that, okay, that one must change the Lord for you to divorce, or something like that. He says, no, but that is wrong. This is the correct one. And so, Jesus says that to many people, he met sinners. When he met sinners, name them. The woman was caught in adultery, we are told. Neither will I condemn you. I will show you. But go and do what? And say no. When they say, say no more, you understand it. Change your life. He was saying to the woman, I will not stone you, but go and change your lifestyle. But they are saying that now, they are saying that, I'm saying they because those who are advocating for this is. Now, no. He said, I will not condemn you, but let us come and be, be the same. Do whatever we want. It's not so. It's not so. Never so. So they, they, they keep saying that, oh, it is oh, be merciful. God, this was merciful. <laughs> you see, mercy comes after repentance. Uh, mercy comes after repentance. Let me quote John 3:16, that beautiful passage. I hear it's the most popular, or rather, yeah, verse in the Bible. For God so loved the world that, you know, the quotation, John 3:16. 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not what? perish, but have whosoever believes in Him. That is it. So it starts from repentance, accepting Jesus, then mercy comes in. See, God, God, God saw that human beings cannot do anything on their own. Because he sent so many prophets and things were not working. So he said, no, I, I, I don't want to keep trying and do trying and error. No, the prophets were kind of trying and error. To change us, we couldn't do that. Let now say my own son Jesus. And he says, own oh, son, only be God to your son Jesus. To come down amongst us to change things for us. And he came to die for us. And since then, now we can cry, Abba, Father. Now, since then, if you pray, our prayers can be heard. Because the bridge has been put together again. It was broken down because of our sins. In the Catholic Church, we know that. Baptism brings that. When we baptize, or we are baptized, we become new creation. For behold, all old things are past, all things have become. You. And even after baptism, and you happen to fall, that is not the end of the story. We call it penance and reconciliation, confession. You go back to God and then you reconcile. So, anybody who is in any difficulty, any problem, it is not over for you. If you have homosexual tendencies, that doesn't mean that you are going to hell. No. It means that you have a cross. Carry it. Jesus doesn't want to live with that lifestyle. There are two things. I may have the, the tendency to, to do what? To sin. Or you may think of fornicating. Let's see that way. But you going ahead to do it is a different thing. 
The feeling alone is not sinful. You see, they call it concupiscence. <laughs> uh, it's a big way, but that's the meaning. It's not sinful. But you planning it and then executing it becomes a sinful aspect. So if in your relationship you're having challenges, whatever they are, please bring them before Jesus. Bring them before the altar of God. Bring them before this mountain. That is why we go, we go to church. That is why we pray. Because Jesus can end every situation that is not necessary in our lives. Do you believe that? And Jesus can change you 100%, not 85%. Total conversion. We need that. Christians, we need that. Catholics. So the mercy of God is there. The mercy of God, nobody can imagine, is so huge. So huge that we can't just get enough of it. Now, whenever we repent and come to him, he embraces us. He goes his back. He brings us back into his house. Look at the story of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. It's so interesting. The boy takes his money, his possessions, runs home, away, spends everything, finishes it. Then he takes a home. I will go back to my father. And then he comes home, the father runs to him and embraces him. So seeing the God who is in sin must make an attempt of changing. Then God's mercy can be applied to you. You don't stay in sin and say, forgive me. When you go to confession, bless me, Father, for sin and sin. And then you say the act of confession. You say that, okay, the prayer says that with the help of God, you try not to sin uh, again. So don't want you go to confession thinking that tomorrow I'm going to sin. No, no, no. You are going there because for that very day we tend to stop it. We don't say, we don't confess for future sins. Hello? Hello? We don't confess for future sins. No, no, no. It is the past and present. So we confess because we have done something against God. After what happened tomorrow, that is God's business. But today, if you hear His voice, harden not your hearts. So once you're able to accept that, that God, look, this is me. In my relationship, I try not to get in, engage in sex. But it's becoming difficult for me. I go to confession. And the boy, I'll rise up and go to my father. He rise, rise up. He go for confession. Bless me, Father. God forgives you. You become a new creation. Then, tomorrow it happens again. So, the next day happens again. Oh, God will, God will suck me by again. Then. Do not suck you. Nobody is too dirty for God to accept. Oh look, I've done it for two years, for many years. Well, God, you start to me listen to me. And every month I can't compare the same thing. God is even fed up with me and my sin. This same every day, every month, every year, he's fed up with me. He's not fed up with you. He's called a God of mercy. Mercy is his name. The word mercy is not a, it's not an abstract word. In the name of a person, God. We say mercy, I'm talking about God. God Himself is mercy. So, no matter our not, times of falling, God still loves us. So, the Catholic Church says this the position of the Catholic Church on homosexual, homosexuality. We are not, not we, God is not against homosexuals. As we say, it is the sin of homosexuality that God is against. I hope I'm not confusing you. All right. You see, because God, you here, myself here, you are, I want to say, it's a, it's a thing, but I want to say, but let me say for a want of a better example. You are, you, can, you are a potential fornicator, right? You understand that way? You are a potential sinner. Okay, that is better. So it means that you have a tendency of sinning. You can sin because you are human being, right? Human beings sin, not uh, animals. No, they don't say they are, they are not sinning, no. Uh -huh. The animals, they are always different. Same is for us. Uh -huh. So, you human being, once a human being have the tendency, the ability to send this in you. Because of what happened in the Genesis chapter 1, 2, 3. The original sin. You have the desire to sin. That is why Paul says in Romans chapter, I think, there is 7 verse 15. Now look, the good things I want to do, I can't do. And then the things I don't want to do, every day I'm doing them. God, why? This one, take it that way. Why? Paul, the holy man, was battling with this. He prays, he worships God, he praises God, he, he preaches, he goes on right with this, and yet, when he's alone, he tells himself, hey, the 
the things are not going to do what we need. The things are not supposed to do. See, he doesn't know. So God help me. So that is the issue. And we all have, we all have the ability to sin. But the fact that you can sin doesn't mean that God should wipe you from the earth. No, you wouldn't do that. You relax you. You have been created in the image and likeness of what? Of God. Imago Dei, they call it. In Latin, Imago Dei, the image of God. So we are all Imago Dei of God. We are all Imago Dei of God. So as you are sitting, you are God. By your image and your likeness, you resemble God. So that is why God not cast away any of his images. But if we sin, it's the sin that he is against. So anybody with any homosexual tendency, anybody who had a feeling of homosexuality or homosexual rather, is not cut, cut, cut off. It's when you engage in them, then you are cut off. It's when you have told yourself that I will not stop this, I will do it, then you are cut off. I will see this example of a, a mobile phone. You no, know, when, when, when you are, you have a mobile phone, I think most of us do, uh, and then you have credit, and then you go somewhere where, where there is no coverage. Come and hear you. know you can make a call. Hello? Praise the Lord. You may have a uh, hundred CDs credit on your phone. But there's no coverage area, uh, coverage in your area. Can you make a call? Your, your units are useless. Because you are not in the coverage area. You are not within coverage area. When we sing, and what we call more casting, I mean, that's what happens to us. We name them, we know them. Fornication, the adulteries, the homosexualities. That is what happens to us. We are cut off. It's like, because you, you saw the goodness in you, but you are out of coverage area. Whatever you do cannot reach. You are out. That is why you need to go to confession. And confession brings you back within coverage area. Then your credit can become useful. Otherwise, you okay to waste your time. You can die 100 times out of coverage area. You can never make a call. You have credit. Yes. You are not within covered area. I just wasting your time. And that's why we say, college you have linear sin and uh, mortal sin. And this I'm quoting from uh, 1 John chapter 5, verses 16 and 17. It talks about linear sins and mortal sins. 1 John 5, 16 and 17. Linear sins are like uh, you are in covered area, but your credit is finished. You know, sometimes if you are in covered area, you don't have credit. You, know, you, you cannot make a call. Are you aware? You are in covered area, all right, but you have no credit, so you can't make a call. But others can call you. You can send you a text message, but you cannot call and receive text message. So, when you commit more vineyard sins, that's what happens. So, that's why if you commit vineyard sins and you go to March and say, I confess Almighty oh, God, and then you are taken away. That's why vineyard sins, you can pray and say, God, I'm sorry, and they are taken away. Because you are still within coverage area. So, as we know, when you are members, so you meet together and you are praying and asking God to forgive our sins, we are praying for vineyard sins. Please don't forget that. Because as we are here, we are, we are people with good hearts. We, have, we don't have credit for God because we have sinned. But we are within coverage area. So when you meet as renewal you message, you are confessing our sins. It's for doing that that we are confessing. When the one has sinned, the one has sinned, you are out of coverage area. So whatever prayer you say here, it will not work. But you are out of coverage area. That's why for those ones, the church says go to the priest for confession. And for the linear sins, you can stand here. Bow your head in silence, and because of the coverage area, you can say, God forgive me, and He forgives you. I'm talking about this because of the issue of uh, what you, uh, the issue at stake. So, my dear sisters, my dear brothers, um, I'm ending my speech now, or my talk, with the churches respond to these challenges of marriages. So, the Catholic Church says that no, marriage is one man and one woman, because this is what it is from the beginning. From the beginning, man and woman, the case is close. How that thing that they say? The case is close. It's finished. No one can change it again. And then the Catholic Church says again that despite this, if you are in a relationship and you have any challenges, it is not the end of for you. There's possibility of you coming out. If your relationship is, is manned by sexual issues, you can talk, you can stop it. Sit down, analyze the relationship with your friend, your partner. Go to confession. Resolve not to do whatever is wrong. And then your life starts again. 
So the Catholic Church is not saying that if there's a homosexual, he cannot come to Mass. He can come. He comes, but he has in mind that God, look, I'm a sinner like any other person, like me. But God help me, so I don't practice this thing. It's the practice that God is against, not the person. Not the person. So the person, God loves him. The practice, God hates it. He calls sin. And then, as you can hear, as you are hearing, uh, this week especially, the bishops are in Rome uh, discussing the future of the family. Some of these things, they want to talk about them. Uh, people who marry in church, and yet they don't get children. They are not getting their children. They have prayed and prayed and prayed. What should happen? If somebody has been married for five years, ten years, and no child, how can we help start a family, a couple? Because marriage is to death. They can't separate themselves. So the church is thinking about how to help set people. People are married and then their wives, their husbands are giving them problems. The woman is difficult. The husband is difficult. She, she's not happy in the relationship. She wants to come out, but she can't because she's Catholic. God has been established in heaven. She can't take them out. How she helps set people? People have relationship, uh, problems in relationships. How can we help them? So the church is meeting to think of how to address the issue of the family. Children who are difficult. You know? And then even your own family, some, somebody has a homosexual tendency. You know it. Your son, your daughter, your child. How will you treat the person? How do you help the person to come out or to deal with it? So the church is meeting in Rome as we speak, discussing that. And then that is why this, this year again, the Holy Father, uh, Pope Francis, has declared the year of mercy uh, to help us all to receive God's mercy. We all, we are all sinners. And we should have time for God's mercy. That we should come close to God. He needs us. He wants us. He loves us uh, to be with Him. I will end by assuring all of us that everybody here has a cross. We all have crosses. Some are long, others are short. Some are heavy, others are light. Yet, we all have crosses. Because Jesus said that if you want to follow me, what did he say? Very good. Take up your cross and not follow me. So, if you are a Christian and don't have any cross, you are not following Jesus yet. You are not resurrected yet. So, if you are married, and the children are not coming. Please don't be disturbed. You are not wiped out. You are not cancelled out. You are not out of the picture. See that as your cross. Keep praying to God. To have, to have a, the strength to carry it. If you are a married person and your husband, your wife is becoming difficult, doing these things there, doing that thing there, and you don't know how to overcome it, see it as your cross. And then pray to God. God, if, like Jesus was saying, if you don't take this cup over me, let your will be done. But give me the strength to carry it. If you are here and you want a marriage partner, you are a faithful woman, a faithful man, and you have been praying, things are not happening. For now, see it as your cross. If it's the will of God that you should be in this world without marrying, and it's your cross, thank be to God. Accept it. The only thing that these days, people, they are not, it's not a problem. Little Christians preach Christianity without cross. So if a Christian must be married by force, not by force, but at all at all cost. If a Christian you marry must give birth. If a Christian you marry, you must not have problems. That's what people are preaching. But that is so he never said that. Did he say that? Did he say you should follow me without a cross? See, you see, carry your cross and follow me. So we follow Jesus with a cross. So those who preach that if we are Christian, if we are worship God, we shall have no problem in life. It is not true. The master, the one who brought Christian, says, throw me the cross. So you have different crosses. So if your marriage is your cross, relationship is your cross, please carry it and follow him. Now, the most important thing is that follow him with the cross. Because you want to go to heaven. And the last two weeks you had it. It's better to go to heaven single than to marry and be thrown into what? Hellfire. You heard it last, last Sunday. It's better to go to heaven without a child than to have a child in your marriage and go to what? Hellfire. It's just to say it. So please, don't worry. You are faithful. That, you must end up in heaven. That is the target. You want to go to heaven? Hello? Praise the Lord. You want to go to heaven?
Tell me. Whatever you are, please be that. Carry your crosses. Follow Jesus. It's everything that you want. Husbands, wives, children, these are just byproducts. You carry on your way. You get them. You are coming to Kumasi. If you are lacking there, somebody selling something on the road. If I don't get to say, hold you, you wouldn't drive me. Or is it the thing they are saying by the roadside that while you are going to Mass? No. If I like it, somebody stand by the roadside and say, okay, you buy. But nobody is selling. You are, by the time you are going, nobody is selling by the roadside. You have to tell this person when he was going to Mass, she bought this by the roadside, and he had not been to our the journey. You don't stop. Go. What matters is not my take your destination. So husbands and wives and children and whatever, they are all things they sell along the way of life to heaven. If you get them, fine. You don't get them, heaven must not miss you. Heaven must not miss you, amen? And don't miss heaven too. We pray that God give us the courage, the strength to hold on to our crosses. And my prayer is that also those of us who are looking for partners, if it's God's will, may He bring them your way. Those of you who are looking for children in your marriages, if it's God's will, may your womb be opened. Amen. Those of us who want peace and happiness in our marriages, if it's God's will, may those happiness come. Amen. About four, may God lead you in all your struggles, with all your challenges, one day to the glory of heaven. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Amen. 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 Before entering into a relationship, I will take the next question. Okay, okay. Right, so this is a question time, and we have had four questions. I will take them and then try to answer them as much as possible. Number one, um, somebody wanted to know, uh, how do we know this is my man, this is my woman? Is that a question? Yes, uh, right pattern, you call it. Uh, I think you gave us the answer there, but you mentioned it silently. Of course, the first thing comes from God. Uh -huh. So it is through prayer. How to be more practical? If I say prayer, it sounds a bit. Uh, you, how, you, how long should you pray? How long should you ask me? You know? So let me be practical. Again, go back to Genesis chapter 2. And when Adam was made to sleep, you know what happened? Because God was going to pray for him, his if I away. Okay. So when Adam slept and he woke up, then it was there for him. So number one. Adam didn't go looking, looking for his thief. Are you aware? God brought his thief to him. That is very interesting. And how did God bring... Uh, let me bring it, I want to make it more... How did God bring the thief to him? Or how did God bring thieves to us? How, 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 how does he bring them to us? He was asleep. When you sleep, my dear friends, you can't do anything. When you are asleep, you are like half dead. When you are sleeping, what happens around you? You have no control. I hope you are aware. So for God to make Adam sleep, is the spiritual meaning is that God has, uh, sorry, Adam had no control on the if God was giving him. He had no control. So when he was asleep, defenseless, doing nothing, inactive, God was active, working. He woke up, God brings him his if. So in every relationship, that's why prayer should be number one. The man you are marrying today, the one you are marrying tomorrow, is because God has brought him to you. God has brought her to you. You may wake up and, see, and say, oh, at last, this is bone of my bone, flesh my flesh. But before you could say that, bone of my bone, flesh my flesh, it's God who has what? Brought him to you. Brought her to you. Please do you understand that. So when you meet somebody, and then you feel that, now, this is a man, this is a woman. Don't think that it's you who's making the choice. Before that person came to meet your standard, God had already made prepared the person for you. So in relationship, he said that it is God who chooses for us. He brings the partners. Of course. So the number one is prayer. We have these number of friends who are opposing. Pray about it. God help me to see which of them is correct. Correct and say that that will suit you because the person will be suitable to you. Now what do you do? You have to look at the people also. Can this person help me worship God more? Faith number one, I think there was a question about that, you know. Uh, how, how do we give the appearance or by faith, you know? As I said, you see, all these relationships are towards what? Going back to God. 
So for me, I keep saying that the first thing criteria in choosing, uh, as the uh, brother asks, is that would this person lead me to heaven? So the religion or the person's religious or faith background is very important. And as for you, some say that Father, I don't, it doesn't matter to me. Uh, if he's not a Christian, if he's not whatever, it doesn't matter. I just want the man. <laughs> I just want the woman. No, that should be secondary. The first thing is that would that relationship help you to build your life to God? So if the person is a, 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 a God-loving person, whether he's a Catholic or not, he should be God-loving. Would he promote your faith as Catholic? You see, they look, look at that also. So that is uh, the, the other question. So my dear friends, it's through prayer, and then after the faith aspect, are you compatible? Are you able to chat? I mean, do you, when you are together, do you feel comfortable? I mean, these are things that will come now, your personal things can come in. Do you feel okay when you are with him? Are you able to talk to him? Are you able to share ideas? Are you able to talk to him? Are you able to share ideas with him? No, this is kind of compatibility. Then prayer and what you are seeing or what you are experiencing, then you keep praying till the, the day comes to pass, you know? And for me, I said that if I have a partner, somebody in mind, in mind you want to marry, and this is the man you want, this is the one you want, keep praying. So your wedding day, if nothing happens, he is for you. If nothing happens, she's for you. When I wanted to be a priest, you see, I never knew I would be a priest, so I was ordained. So I tell myself, I'll never leave the seminary, because I want to be a priest. But if along the way they ask me to leave, then God doesn't want me. And I didn't leave. And they didn't ask me to leave. And I was ordained. So I can say now, look by yourself, God called me. How do you understand that? You are driving, there's no traffic like, why are you stopping? <laughs> eh? You don't stop. If you are driving, there are no traffic lights, what do you do? Keep driving. So you like this man, like that lady, and you are in a relationship, keep moving until there's a problem. And you can't go on, there's a traffic light, hey, let's stop and examine. But if there's no traffic light and the guy is okay, he worships, you also worship, you're okay, please keep driving. If Mary comes in, Mary, God take of the rest. Amen. Amen. How, how do the homosexual, no, rather, uh, I don't know how to put it, let's say LGBT, that is a better word to use, uh, those into homosexuality, he's saying that how do they. Um, Alright, so the person is asking, how are people lured into these things? How do the people, how do they lure people, in, the youth especially? Uh, I would say because they lure, lure us with things that we want. I know these days, as a youth, you want to have everything. Have a job. So they can say, well, I'll give you a job. Uh, and some, these days, people don't care. Even if I'm playing room for to do this, what I want is a job. And the money I'll get. So they will go. So they can offer you a job. You know, they offer you some fiscal things, can give you so much money, can sponsor you, no sponsorship. You want to do degrees and masters and other, and they don't have money, they will sponsor you. It's the money you want, please take it. They can buy you that, give you a house, and give you a car, whatever it is. So, they give, they use things that are enticing. And people like that, like that. Uh, and then because of that, what they will get, they don't care, or fraud. After what, then they'll go into it. So they, they lure the youth, especially with things that they need, the needs of the youth. The youth these days want things, physical things, money, power, fame, which shall make you popular, you know, which shall sponsor you, prestige, you know. These are the things that I want to become known, be a celebrity, so they can make you all, they can give all these things. People will do that because they, they will make you famous. But in the end, that fame is the same fame in heaven. That is what the, the, the question of eternity. And there's a question on uh, the Catholic Church. Somebody said, no, 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 please. The Catholic Church says no to homosexuality. Not because, as I said, it's God. Man and woman, he created them. The man should leave and marry. So homosexuality is out of the question. Deuteronomy chapter 11 speaks against it. Paul will speak against all those unions as abomination. And so those one, that one is clear. Because we cannot change what is in the Bible, the Catholic Church says that homosexuality or lesbianism, as she asks, are all wrong. They are sins. Sins, just, just as fornication is a sin, adultery is a sin. So they are all sins. And we say that. The only thing we, I'm saying is that we don't say that because this person is a homosexual, go and stone him, or go and stone her. We shall not stone them, because they are also in the image of God. The same way the woman was caught in adultery or not stoned, 
you shall not stone them. But you can encourage, you, shall, you have to encourage them to, like the woman, to go and sin no more. But it's a sin. The same way fornication is a sin, adultery is a sin. And the last one, I think, yeah, the pastor issue. Can a pastor divorce? I don't know. Yeah, I can't be so when you say a pastor divorce, it sounds funny to me. Uh, because as you know, Catholics are, their pastors are who? And a priest. The word pastor, pastores, means a shepherd. It's a shepherd. And you know what is a shepherd? A shepherd is someone who has a what? A flock. So if you, are, you have no people living, you, you are not a leader. You become a leader when you are leading some people. So pastor means a shepherd, pastores. You know. So Kalichi, the pastors are the priests. So if you ask me, do, can a pastor divorce? It's not funny now. You know why I'm, uh, it's funny now? Ah, can a father divorce? He's already, already married. Okay. Uh, the prince is not married, first, so he cannot divorce. So, I think you are asking this question in the life of pastors who are not uh, Catholics, right? Yes. I thought yeah, their understanding of marriage and ours is different. We Catholics call marriage a sacrament. But then by God, it is God who, who brought marriage, as we heard in Genesis. And the other churches who are not Catholics, some are here these days are, are buying the Catholic church's understanding. They want to stick to what the Bible says. But other churches are free, they say that marriage is not a sacrament. It's not like any social event, of course, because they are Christians, like the pastors who come and then they do their church. But the way we see marriage and the way they see marriage are different. It's like in the Catholic Church, marriage is first class. And the other churches, they see marriage as second upper, or even third class for some. So you see, we have given different ratings. Uh -huh. So they, because they don't value marriage the way we value it, sometimes they allow a divorce. You can say that if your husband cheats on you, leave him and go. If your wife cheats on you, leave him and go. So for them, when they say to them, it's past, I don't know why they say that anyway, but when they say that, they have in mind that something can separate. Some weakness on the mountain one can separate. So in their church, if their pastor wants to divorce, I cannot say it's wrong or not because that is the understanding. But if you bring it to Kali church, it's not allowed. It's only Kali marriage that you can't divorce. After their church and their marriage, that is a different thing for them. So a pastor in a different church who wants to divorce his wife, and that is his business, actually, because whether he in the church they say that divorce is allowed, that's why he divorced him. Fine. But for us Catholics and for God, marriage is in heaven. No one mar marries and divorces. Because, as I said, let no man put a son down. Amen. Alright, two more questions. How long should one be in a relationship? <laughs> this question is interesting. I, I, I would say to tell, tell me, you are sure? <laughs> uh, I think that, that's the best answer. So you are sure that this man is for you, this woman is for you. Some take uh, three months, some six, some years. You know, but uh, if you ask me, less than three months, I would say it's, it's, it's not enough. Uh, it's, it's not enough because don't forget, you're going to be the person all the days of your life, right? So studying him more, not less than three months. But how long should they be with the person? That should be, as I'm saying, so, so you realize that you're okay. Uh, you know, you, you might not get 100% okay, but if she scores 85, 90, he scores 90, at least you can, you can give it a try, you know. <laughs> yes, most people are married, ask them, they, they, they don't have 100% sure of their, their partners. Uh -huh. They enter with some 90% and then God added a 10% for them. Like a teacher, who, who, a, very, a very good teacher, you know. When you do a uh, bonus, eh? they give you their lesson. So that is it. Myself, as a priest, I wasn't 100% sure of being a priest. I give it a try, I keep trying for nine years, trying for nine years, imagine you know. what again, the nine years that has happened, why should I go away? So I ended. So please keep on it. And if there's nothing that I say, if there's no traffic light, keep driving. And that is the, the motto. See, go ahead of the relationship and then go ahead and marry. But if you see the traffic light, no question mark, then you can take your break. Otherwise, uh, please, as I said, uh, there's no definite time period duration to be in a relationship. When you are satisfied, go ahead and leave the rest to God. And uh -huh. then somebody asked something about Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. Uh, be, God blessed them, God blessed them, and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. And that's where the question is coming from. So, because God said that, 
Uh, if somebody marries and he has no children, why should she or he take it as, as his cross or cross? What's it be fruitful? Who said that you be fruitful? It's not God. And who gives children? Is it the man who you're married that will give the child? Is it the one you married that will give the child? You see, okay. So the man who made the commandment, it's not a commandment. And this is what it's not be there doesn't mean you are commanded to give birth. If, if, again, as I said, it sometimes deceives us. It is at the, the what? It's at the which one should I do? It is at the, at the quest of, of, of the person who is giving the command. It depends on him. Yeah. If it's a be fruitful, it depends on him. It depends on him. Children so are a gift of the Lord. As you hear again in the scriptures, you know that. Gift of the Lord. So, you see, when you come to me and ask me, Father, can I have your mobile phone as a gift? <laughs> you know, you have two answers. And that is what? Yes or what? I can give it to you. When I give it to you, is it a gift? Hello? Is it a gift? You asked me for a phone, I gave you, I bought one for you. Is it a gift? Ah, you are not paying for it, so what is a gift? It's a gift. You can't buy yourself a phone, you ask me to buy your phone, I buy it for you. It's a gift, right? Then you have the second kind of a gift. You are there, then I come to you, take this mobile phone. You see the different kinds of gifts you have now. You have gifts that can be asked for. You have gifts that are given to you without asking for them. This is the meaning we have to attach to uh, this passage. Hello. Good. So, that's why you pray. And pray. And pray. And then he's not giving you. You can't create your own children. You can't manufacture the child. The man has said that be fruitful and multiply. And you are praying and then the man who has said that is not answering that. What do you do? You can't force him. He doesn't want gifts. So just sit quiet and take it like that. Keep praying. If he opens, fine. He doesn't. But some of some people even don't pray for that thing when they're married. They get married, then one month, two months later, she's pregnant. It comes like that. So you see, some have to pray for it, and they don't even pray, and it comes to them like that. They are all gifts. So when they say that, that is the impression. And since it depends on the one who is giving, then the one who is asking for it cannot be blamed. Because whatever you say cannot change, cannot add to. You get a, 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 a child. You cannot create them. You cannot manufacture them. It is God who gives children. So that is a context in which I want, I want to see people who are in marriages and they are not getting children. If they have asked and prayed and they are not getting them, that's when I'm saying that they see it as your, your cross. You can't give yourself to them. Let him give them to you. Amen. When Jesus carried a cross, he carried to a point, Calvary, then he laid it down. So if for you, your covering will be here on earth, and that cross will carry your marriage will be laid here on earth. Don't worry, Jesus will make sure that when your covering comes, that cross will be put down. Amen. If your covering will be in heaven, which means that that cross will have to keep it for the rest of your life to you need the strength to carry it. I pray that God will help us as Christians, as Catholics, as youth, to be faithful to Him, even in relationships, and to be faithful to Him, even in marriages. Amen. God bless you all. Amen.